Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, today we're going to talk about a topic that my little dog Lily has been after me to do for quite a long time. Talk about the Dog Genome Project. Okay, so a little history. The, you know, the start of the uh, Human Genome Project in the late 90s uh, was a really monumental undertaking to sequence the human genome. And a, a, a scientist named Craig Venter split off and, and started a company called Celera Genomics and published the first sequence of, two th of the human genome in 2001. It was not complete, and of course, it was his, his sequence. Uh, but the NIH wasn't doing it that way. They had a sequence of many, many different folks. So 70% was from one individual, but 30% was from 19 different individuals from African, East Asian, European, and South Asian descent. So. In 2003, the, the NIH Human Genome was published, which was a more complete sequence, uh, and was declared completed. But at the very same year, 2003, they started the Dog Genome Project, and the subject of that uh, sequencing was Tasha, the famous boxer. Now, I have a picture of Craig Ventner and Tasha <laughs> that look remarkably similar, but that's another thing. So why would anyone want to, why would anybody want to sequence the dog? Well, you know, in one species, the dog has one of the most largest variations uh, of any species of mammals on the planet. So they are considered the most diverse species. And just an example, here's, here's a Pekingese that weighs a couple of pounds, but in the same species, you have a St. Bernard that weighs over 180 pounds. And they all vary by body size, fur type, body habitus, and especially behavior patterns. <laughs> don't I know that? <laughs> don't, don't we all dog owners know that? So what was the goal of the Genome Project, Dog Genome Project? It was to understand how dog uh, genomes contribute to health and disease in general, to identify the genetic variants that were associated with morpho morphologic traits and behavior, and to develop a community resource to enable others to do the same with other species, and really to study uh, diseases of both canine and human. And the goal was to sequence 10,000 dogs, create a genetic map, uh, and then uh, figure out how this, how the genetics uh, it was involved with domestication, breed formation, aging behavior, and morph morphologic variations. So, as I said, the boxer that was chosen was Tasha, female boxer, and they picked that breed because they looked at 60 different breeds of dogs, and the boxer has the least amount of variation uh, within its genome. So if you're looking for a reference standard to compare all things, then the one that's least variable is the best. Uh, it's very similar to the human ge genome, about three billion uh, uh, base pairs. And there have been more than 350 inherited diseases that have been described in dogs, including cancer, heart disease, deafness, blindness, uh, differences in longevity, and of course my two favorite, doggy dementia and retrieving behavior. So, you know, these are difficult to study in humans particularly retrieving behavior. <laughs> it's very difficult to study in humans. So probably best to do that in dogs. Uh, anyway, in addition to the boxer, there was nine other dog breeds, four wolves, and a coyote. <laughs> Poor unfortunate coyote was found wandering around. Uh, it was captured and became part of the genetic markers. The project uh, is not yet completed. It's still going on. And so you can actually participate. But the, but the NIH says it requires enthusiastic and I emphasize enthusiastic participation of owners because you have to, you know, submit a lot of veterinary records, answer a lot of surveys, you got to collect some saliva and urine on your dog. Who wants to do that? And the big advantage, of course, is not only, you know, they're not primates, thank God, because primates are pain, <laughs> and everyone always gets worried about primates. And the other thing is you don't have to house them in the lab because you, the participant, house the dog. Pretty good way to save on lab lab expenses. You own the dog, you own it, you send in the samples. So let's start thinking about the studies that have been uh, uh, made by uh, studying dogs. So there's a really interesting study in Nature uh, from 2022 that looked at 66 newly found ancient wolf genomes from Europe, Siberia, and Western North America. And what they found was that the gray wolf was the very first species to give rise to a domestic animal. So gray wolf started having domestic uh, population formed, and they remained very widespread uh, throughout the last ice age when other large mammals disappeared. So it was really smart for these dogs, these newly domesticated dogs, as a mo means of survival, to be friendly, probably hang around humans. So it had more ability to, to keep them warm. 
So if, if this is really fascinating to me. If you look at the evolution of dogs going 10 million years to just a few hundred, you know, 100,000 years ago, the domestication off split from gray wolves happened just about 100,000 years ago. When you look at the evolution of modern man, all, man also about 100,000 years ago. So these really co-evolved. As modern man evolved, they, they domesticated gray wolves and they became uh, uh, partners in life. 100,000 years this has been going on. Nobody wants cats. <laughs> no cat eat. Cat didn't evolve like that, but dogs did. So within that dog uh, variation, you can see the dog and the gray wolf are the closest related. This is a relatedness diagram where the branches I mean they're closely related. And the one that's farthest from the domestic dog is the African wild dog, which I got a chance to go see in Botswana, actually. So just to show you how different those dogs are, this is an African dog over here. And of course, this is Miss Lily. <laughs> they don't look at thing like this dog would eat that dog anyway. So there are a bunch of dog mutations that actually mimic human disease. So here's, here's two dogs that I was able to get to d demonstrate their short legs, taking a nap in bed together. You can see they have very, very short legs. So the stunted dog legs, this is due to uh, a, a disease called chondrodysplasia. They don't form fully their bones. Every stunted dog, not just these dogs, but all the stunted dogs, are the result of a single genetic duplication event that took place in their evolution it's with fibroblast uh, growth factor 4, FGF4. And what happened, there was a duplication of that gene that was inserted into the genome. And that second gene is responsible for the errant development of limbs. And it happens in dogs, all these short-legged dogs, like dachshunds, have this duplication of FGF4. But in man, there's also kind of dysplasia. I didn't show you a picture of that, but you know, the dwarfs that you've seen around look, you know, have short limbs. There's also brachycephaly in man and dogs. This is an example of a dog, a bulldog. Uh, they have shortened heads, refer to their sort of smashed in snort, short nose and face. English and French bulldogs, Boston Terriers, Pugs, Pekingese, Shih Tzus, Cavalier King Charles all have this uh, defect, and it's in a bone morphometric bone morphogenic protein, BMP3 gene, that contributes to the abnormality of the development of the, of the head and face. And there are many diseases caused by uh, genetic mutations. Atopic dermatitis occurs in 47% of, of golden and Labrador retrievers. In German shepherds, it is associated with a segment of chromosome 28. That's uh, atopic dermatitis. Uh, myxomatous mitral valve disease, or mitral valve prolapse, very common in young women and humans but it's also common in toy breeds and can lead to early heart failure with an average age of six uh, years old. Many dogs develop cataracts as they get older, but there's a genetic mutation, and you can see this bilateral cataracts in this little terrier. Uh, it's an autosomal, uh, autosomal recessive disease of HSA1, the gene HSA1. It's common in terriers and French bulldogs, and there's an autosomal var variant that's, uh, that's common in Australian shepherding breeds. Boxers suffer from progressive retinal atrophy. They have sensitivity to drugs, right ventricular cardiomyopathies, and Van Willebrand's disease, which is a disease of platelets. And uh, as a nephrologist, I know this, kidney stones and renal disease are very common in Dalmatians, Newfoundlands, Bichon Frise, and miniature schnauzers. So if you have any of those dogs, you'll be seeing a nephrologist sooner than you want. Now here, <laughs> it gets better, it gets better. So there's an, a, an ongoing study of cancer in golden retrievers and an aging study in dogs. So the golden retriever lifetime study uh, began in 2012, and the idea is to collect 3,000 dogs uh, and sequence them uh, in order to determine what are the genetic uh, uh, predispositions for cancer. And, and that's because golden retrievers have a very common can a predisposition to cancer. But, with all the interest in longevity in 2019, the Dog Aging Project was started. That's a long-term study of health longevity, and the goal was to enroll 50,000 dogs and sequence them. And early results from that uh, study suggest that dogs with active lifestyles, <laughs> this kills me, are at decreased risk of doggy dementia, and that living in a good social environment in a home that includes other pets may be good for canine health. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm reading the popular press in, in, with people. Exercise, be friendly with people, that'll help you. <laughs>
This kills me. In addition, Nationwide Pet Insurance and Mars Pet Care own multiple veterinary chains. They are recruiting 20,000 canines to get a biological sim, so they're going to collect tissue to go along with the dogging, aging, dogging age project. Now, if you're interested, for those of you who want to enroll your dog, there is a website, Meet the Pack, and there are all these dogs that have been enrolled in the Dog Aging Project, and the only requirement is that you have a good estimate of your dog's age. <laughs> <laughs> This reminds me of Little League. <laughs> when I started, and somebody would show up with their kid, they said, well, I think it's about 12, but the kid's 24 years old. <laughs> but anyway, if you're enjoying, interested in joining the pack, you can do that. And the cohorts, it's not just a general, and they're actually specific cohorts. There's a genomic study to enroll your dog in. There's a precision medicine. And there's my favorite, because every one of, every hum, everybody I know is saying, what about rapamycin to live longer? Well. There's a rapamycin in aging dogs. It's called the triad study. And it's, it is a double-blind placebo-controlled trial to look at whether ra uh, rapamycin can cause uh, long, can improve lifespan in dogs. Now, they're doing a randomized controlled study, but nobody wants to do that in humans. I love that. It's just, <laughs> just give me some. Why not just try it? Now, here's another one. There's, a, there's an investigator, Eleanor Carlson at UMass, who started the Darwin Drug Project. This project has enrolled 44,000 dogs, 4,000 have had their genome sequence, and the goal is mostly around uh, neurologic and psychological diseases. So they're studying psych disorders like OCD, autism, epilepsy, and dementia. And she published a paper on the early findings that, and I love this, breed is a poor predictor of an individual dog's personality. <laughs> She's never met a dachshund, <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> But, you know, again, I, I mean, I'm, not make, I'm sure she's a lovely person, but in, she said in one study she was looking at OCD, you know, obsessive compulsive dis disorder. Uh, remember the paper she published, there's no, nothing, breed doesn't predict it. And yet she evaluated 87 Doberman pictures <laughs> for OCD, because she knows that those Doberman pictures have OCD. Anyway, there was a recent study that I, in Nature that I thought was really cool also. Here's a dog uh, shaking when they get wet. You know, dogs shake and wet when they get wet. And many breeds do. Not just dogs, but many breeds do. And this is, this is one of the mysteries of neurologic disease. Why does a dog shake? Well, science, that's why. There's, uh, it's called WDS, wet dog shaking. And they were able to, these investigators were able to figure out exactly why this happens. And they used a new technique called optogenetics they implant uh, elect, uh, optic stimulants to various uh, neuron areas to see wh which one either can uh, stimulate or suppress the behavior. And they were able to actually find that in this particular behavior, there's this little set of neurons that are, is, that's re related to the spinal cord that it actually in induces that behavior. And it's different from scratching, it's different from the other, uh, it, the, when you pet them, they can actually distinguish the shaking thing. So it's really kind of fascinating that the, dog, uh, the dog's ability to sense wetness is different from touch uh, and pain and all that other stuff. So a lot of science going on with dogs. Uh, I hope this makes Lily happy finally because she's been after me about this for a long time. I hope you've learned something about your dog. And if you want to enroll in the dog aging study, you can find the website and do that. It takes a committed owner, and I am not a committed owner. Anyway, have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you and your dog next week. <laughs>